Okay, welcome everyone. It's a delight to be here with you today for our final Humanities in Action of the fall 2022 semester. This is unlike our other uh, series, which of course we had five wonderful talks. Let's put our hand, if you were here for this, let's put our hands together for the previous speakers. I think they were just fantastic. Um, and, uh, and I will also now, I'm gonna ask one person I know was here for some of these. Bob Kuykendall has something very important for the in-house crowd to say. That's right, that's right. So, Some of us have to have a role exactly. Well, you do such a good job, and it's he magically made my cell phone go off, and I didn't even have to touch it. So, thank you for that. If you're watching on a cell phone, do not turn it off. Welcome, everyone out there in the ether. We appreciate you uh, tuning in for today's event as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Max Orr. I'm the executive director for Carolina Public Humanities, the outreach arm for uh, the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and it's a real delight to be uh, the principal organizer for these Humanities in Action events as well. I want to thank a few people. Um, of course, we want to thank uh, Vicki Breeden, who is back. Yeah. Welcome, Vicki. Uh, after a, a wonderful tour of adventures, I want to thank Michaela Sinclair, who did such a fantastic job while Vicki was gone. And of course, Paul Bonici, who's making sure that y'all can see out there in the virtual world. We, of course, want to thank our sponsors, the Merka Baumberger Group at uh, Morgan Stanley and the North Carolinaiana Society, both of whom are um, helping to sponsor, especially our K-12 programming throughout the state. And, of course, our partner for all of our events here at, uh, at Flyleaf Books, uh, the General Alumni Association. And if you're not a member of the General Alum Alumni Association, you can sign up and you don't have to be an alum, so check them out. We are so grateful for their support. And, of course, we're grateful for Flyleaf Books. Put your hands together for Flyleaf Books. That's right. Uh, they're a sort of wonderful institution. Now, I'm, a lot of this stuff, many of you have been to many of our programs this fall, so I'm not going to do a lot of repetition because I want to get right into our conversation. But I do just want to remind you folks about Carolina Public Humanities and our mission. Uh, we have these programs here. We have uh, one more, uh, actually two more weekend seminars, but one coming up this weekend, which might be of interest uh, for this group who is interested in democracy, and that is its opposite, a seminar on authoritarianism in modern Europe, which will feature none other than Lloyd Kramer, who is back there. So uh, uh, come and check that out. We do have, it's getting very full, but we have a few more seats available. So if you're interested in signing up for that, let us know. Oh, yes, of course, and we have plenty of virtual seats. Paul is the guardian of the virtual seats, and we have unlimited virtual seats. Actually, I think we do have a limit, but we're not going to hit it. Um, so uh, also check that out. And of course, at the end of the semester, we will have uh, another seminar on dance uh, on December 3rd. Um, Carolina Public Humanities, of course, I mentioned our public programming, some of the ones I just mentioned upcoming. But of course, uh, we also have an extensive K-12 outreach program and an extensive outreach to community colleges throughout the state. Uh, and we have a new initiative which is starting, and we're just in the planning stages. Uh, thanks to a very generous gift from uh, Miriam and Tom Zetlow, we'll be kicking off the Zetlow Civic Engagement Project, which will really be using all of our, um, our networks that we've developed with community colleges and K-12 uh, teachers and institutions throughout the state to get young people and those not touched by the academic world involved uh, and civically engaged. Uh, we think it's incredibly important uh, to be promoting uh, democracy in that way. Um, all of these initiatives, if you're interested in helping us with any of these, we, uh, we certainly welcome your donations to our bottom line. And uh, Paul can drop some information in for our online folks on giving to UNC. And if you're interested in giving to Carolina Public Humanities directly, you can talk to me. Or you can talk to Catherine Bannis, who is here as well from the Arts and Sciences Foundation. So good to see you, Catherine. Um, Humanities in Action was great this year. We had five great talks and we're really excited to be ending here with an open, sort of a more open forum. Let me introduce our panelists here. I promised them I would not read CVs, but let me just explain who we have here. First, we have Dr. Deborah Stroman, whose website says, Professor, Advocate, and Connector, and that pretty much explains why we invited her today. Uh, she is a core faculty member of the Health, Equity, Social Justice, and Human Rights Concentration at the Gilling School of Public Health. In addition, she is the program coordinator of the new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Research Certificate Program, uh, also at, uh, at UNC, um, and also serves on the leadership of the local NAACP chapter as treasurer, and was named, just in uh, October of 2021, the NAACP Woman of the Year. Please welcome wow. uh, uh, Deborah Stroman. Uh, I, I was saying this tireless advocate for social justice, an expert in a range of activities, and there are so many reasons we call on you, including discussions of sports, discussions of equity, discussions of politics, you truly can do everything. Uh, in the middle here, we have Brighton McConnell, is news director at WCHL, 97.9 The Hill in Chapel Hill. 
2019 of graduate, uh, graduate of Carolina with a degree in broadcast journalism. Uh, Brighton worked at the Daily Tar Heel, the Carolina Connection radio show, the Durham Voice, and the Argyle Report before assuming his position as news director for WCHL, which is where, by the way, you'll get the best coverage of local politics. We're excited for him to share his knowledge of some of these local races, and not to put you on the spot, but also to maybe to give us your perspective as a younger voter. So thank you, Brighton McConnell. And uh, finally, yeah, that's right. And for the other side of the spectrum, <laughs> uh, uh, Jason, yeah, Jason Roberts is professor of political science. Uh, He's a product of Washington University in St. Louis where he received his PhD and he taught at the University of Minnesota before coming here in 2008. Dr. Roberts' expertise on American political institutions, especially the U.S. Congress, has put him on the short list of people we call on to discuss elections. Indeed, you asked me earlier, are we gonna do some sort of election preview this year? And here you are, so welcome. Uh, we also, uh, he has also recently taken on the role of, and we love this title, the Captain of Democracy at UNC. What this means is that he is helping to coordinate efforts to promote uh, democracy at and by UNC. This emphasis on democracy is, of course, one of the pillars of the university's strategic plan. Uh, often his talks with us have had some predictions, so maybe we can put him on the spot later for any predictive qualities, but he, he will not let you bet on his predictions. I promise you that. So. Let me tell you what we're gonna do today. I've asked each of our three panelists to start by giving us sort of a few points and things to be thinking about. We'll encourage them to exchange uh, their ideas with each other and we will open up the floor to questions. This time for questions, I'm gonna allow the in-house audience to have a microphone, but please, I would uh, ask that you ask a question or make your comments and then relinquish the microphone <laughs> at some point. So, um, so uh, I have not picked any order for, for where to start, but uh, do, do you wanna just go left to right? Does that sound fair? I'm sure you all like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's put our hands together for our panelists and have a good conversation. Thank you. Thanks first off to Carolina Public Humanities, Dr. Kramer, and thank you to Flyleaf. I'm uh, very honored to be on this panel and to talk about politics. You know, that's the topic that people say you shouldn't discuss, right? Uh, but I think it's important. And certainly when we have that saying, think locally, but act locally, it's really, really important. So with the question posed in terms of three issues, concerns, or three things to think about, I put everything under the umbrella of racial justice. Racial justice, that's my framework. And so when you think about that, I have to start out with the system that I'm deeply involved in, which is education. And it's everything from our history, and thinking about how our framers, it's believed, did not want a highly educated populace, right? And so where are we today? Where we see the defunding of schools, public schools. What's happening with major flagship state institutions in terms of the states pulling back money? So pay attention to that. And then of course we see the myth of meritocracy and we see the different uh, areas of curriculum being challenged. Everything from critical race theory to uh, anything that has to do with cultural education. So education. The next uh, bucket I would say is healthcare. And I believe actually this is the most important system or institution because you can have the, the, the five bedroom home, you can have the Lamborghini, you can have the best boo, spouse, husband, wife, partner, but if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And so when we look at the inequities that are happening within healthcare, I mean, we can go on and on, but everything from the debate around whether or not the Democrats are defunding Medicare to expansion of Medicaid to all the states. Uh, we take a look at guns and firearms, the different political viewpoints on that. Uh, how about privatizing healthcare? So all of these things are very, very important when we think about racial justice with healthcare. And then lastly, I'll speak spe specifically to white nationalism. People say that's why we have more people going to the polls that want to vote because they do believe in humanity and looking up all people, white, brown, and black folks. And then are, we want to turn back the clock. And we believe that white supremacy is real and it belongs in, the, uh, in 2022. And we're going to work to uphold that. And there are white people, there are brown people, there are black people who believe that superior. And so we have to challenge that. So those would be my three things with the racial equity lens on them. 
But certainly I have a lot more to say, but that's where I'll start. Thank you. I think that is, uh, I think, all the points. I definitely took a look at the three things that you need to know from, you know, with my news director hat on, specifically what we try and do at 97.9 The Hill in Chapelboro is really inform people about what is happening in our local races and keep them up to date with what's happening, of course, on election night, but make sure that our populace is informed when it comes to heading to the polls. And there are so many places that people get their news these days or get information, I think, is an even better way to put it. Uh, but we want to make sure that when it comes to the very local races, that we, we can be that voice and that people know that we're a platform for that. This cycle's a little tricky because there aren't as many local elections uh, for our community. There are certainly a handful on our ballot. A lot of them are unopposed. During the primary cycle, that was almost a bigger election cycle for what we were trying to cover because uh, there were so many Democratic primaries and we have so many registered Democrats running. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, the state races are very important in this one too. And of course, when it is the odd number of years and we're looking at town councils, we're looking at county boards of commissioners, school boards, that's very much our bread and butter. And also where we think that people typically have the biggest information gap when it comes to voting. It's the issues that maybe most directly matter to them on a day to day and the people that they are living with and interacting with, but can also be sometimes the races and the candidates that people are least informed on. Uh, but the three things that I think are, in people, are, are important for people to know when it comes to this election cycle, one, obviously, again, saying this as a news director, find yourself a news source that you not only trust, but that you know is credible and ideally that presents information in an unbiased way. A lot of places right now, it's easy to find whatever spin you want it to take. And, and the, the, the more we see social media rise and just people getting their information in different ways, it turns into an echo chamber if you're seeking out what you already want to know. So finding a source that will present you information in an unbiased way or present you as much information and, and context as possible, I think is really key to keep in mind. Obviously, we want to be that on the local level. These midterms have many more national implications. Uh, so that's important to do when it comes to a lot of the national races to be following on Tuesday night. But that is a, a critical one that I imagine a lot of folks in, in our community probably already have, but might not necessarily think about uh, when, it when it comes to, are they presenting things in an unbiased way or how much information is presented about uh, this candidate or this race. Thing number two, I think is important to keep in mind is to get informed and make your own decisions, which sounds a little silly. On the baseline, I think it is something that we all do whenever we go to the polls, but I think an expansion of that is listen to everyone who is running. I think it's really easy to already kind of have your mind made up maybe before going to the ballot, but this is again what we try and do as, as our radio station and website is to present the information for as many candidates as we can and as, as many candidates that will speak to us. There are some that decline and that's, that's all right too, but be sure to get informed by listening to everyone who is running. That way you can be as informed as possible even listening to candidates that you don't necessarily agree with when it comes to what policies that they are saying that they're supporting. The third thing is just keeping the policies in mind. There is so much stuff that happens around election cycles, especially in the media. I mean, it, 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 these days, it's you, you won't know what you're going to see in a headline and what's going to come up in a political race context. But in the end, it's all about the decisions that these candidates are going to make when they are representing you. And so keeping the policies that matter to you in mind when you're looking through the folks who are who are running in your local state and national races i think is uh is the third thing to keep in mind a tough one and there's so many other complications to it but a very key one as well all right well thank you again for having me um so the the three things i think i'll talk about are, are a little bit maybe disconnected but the, the first thing i want to mention is uh jimmy carter why on earth would I mention Jimmy Carter? Anybody know? I'm sorry? Jimmy Carter was the last U.S. president to have to serve during a period of unified government of his party and not lose it in a midterm election. Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush never served with uh, unified Republican control. Bill Clinton, a Democrat, lost, lost the Congress in the 1994 midterm elections. 
George W. Bush, Republicans lost the Congress in the 2006 midterm elections. The Barack Obama administration, the Democrats lost control of the House in the 2010 midterm elections. And President Trump and the Republicans lost control of Congress in the 2018 midterm elections. So the historical context we're going into on Tuesday is one where you would expect if, 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 if patterns hold, the Democrats are going to come up short on, on Tuesday. Now, that's a historical pattern. Sometimes history repeats itself, as Lloyd will tell us, sometimes it does not. So why would that, what, make, what causes that to happen? Why might that happen this time? Why might that not happen this time? Well, typically the reason incumbent parties don't do well at the midterm is that the out party's voters are upset. They're not happy they lost the last election. You may recall 2018, Democrats were incensed that Donald Trump was in the White House. They turned out in record numbers and they, they punished Republican members of Congress for, for that. That's one thing. The second thing is there's a, it tends to be a bit of a policy backlash. Political scientists call that a, a thermostatic response. You know, if, if Republicans are in power, maybe they push, they push policy to a, to a conservative direction. The public responds and says, that's, that's too much in that direction. We're going to pull it back the other way. Alternatively, when Democrats are in power, maybe they pull policy a little bit too far to the left. The public says, that's too far. Let's come back this way. So you get that thermostatic response from the electorate at times. Uh, you also sometimes see the party in power um, get blamed for things that are going on in the, in the economy and the world, whether it's their fault or not. And so it, it's really not good for the Democrats going into Tuesday that inflation is high. Is that their fault? I'm not an economist, I can't say, but they're going to get blamed for it at the polling place, whether it's, it's their fault or not. Some people call that the, the kick the dog theory of, of politics. So that's why it might be a bad night. Why might it not be a bad night for Democrats? Well, part of that midterm response is something that a, a very old political scientist called surge and decline. And the idea was, was when a new president came in, a lot of people from their party got washed into office with them. And then at the midterm, those would go away. They would lose more seats because they were overexposed. They'd won a lot of seats that they had no business winning. Well, if you look at the 2020 election, Joe Biden won the presidency, but the Democrats actually lost House seats. So going into this election cycle, they're not overexposed in the way that you would have, they would have been, you know, as the Republicans were in 2018 or as the as Democrats were in 2010. So there aren't as many seats that they hold now that they shouldn't hold that, that could help them. And then the second thing is, is maybe the, the quality of candidates in some races may work to the Democrats' advantage. Uh, there's been a trend in Republican primaries in recent years where Republican primary voters have been selecting candidates who are not as experienced as they had selected in, in previous election cycles. It used to be the case that holding had, having held office before was a big predictor of who would win a primary. That has not been the case so much in Republican primaries of late. I think probably the best example of that this cycle is uh, the Senate candidate in Georgia for the Republican side, Herschel Walker. Uh, he's, he's proved to be a very controversial candidate, doesn't have a lot of political experience, has a lot of personal baggage. Uh, if you look at the polling in that race, and you know, we can talk later about polling if you want, he's polling well behind the Republican governor there because of, I think, his, his personal failings more than, than his party affiliation. So those are two things that, that could help stem what would otherwise look like a, a you know, a, a tidal wave maybe working against uh, the Democratic Party. And then the final thing I want to mention is, is really not related to that is, is I would, I guess I ask people to pay attention and, and respect and appreciate our election infrastructure and our election workers. I have never experienced or, or been in an election cycle where there was so much vitriol directed towards uh, the men and women who run our elections. These are hardworking people. Most of the, you know, the professional staff are, are, are highly trained professionals. The poll workers you see at the polls are, are, they're not volunteers, they're not well paid for what they're doing. And there's a lot of people out there who are, who are taking out their frustrations with how politics are going essentially on the, on the, on the referees, if you'll, if you'll buy that analogy. And, and that is something that really concerns me because we, we depend on people to give up their time and energy to do this. And um, it, it's, it's saddening to me to see how many people are, are sitting this out and saying, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. I'm not gonna put up with the, with the threats, the harassment, and the, and the vitriol. So if you haven't voted yet when you do vote, thank your poll workers for, for being there and, and helping our democracy function. If you don't like how your, your party does, blame your party. Don't blame the, don't blame the people running the elections. So I'll, I'll end there, Max. Thank you for those uh, comments. Um, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for those coming out now. I'm definitely on. Uh, I wanted to uh, see if we could go back to something you said, uh, Dr. Stroman, and, and ask all three panelists to talk a little bit about the connection between national rhetorical devices or national sort of trends in politics and how they affect local races. In particular, I'm thinking about something like education, where we have a sort of a national discourse about you know, what's going on and, and sort of vilifying teachers or whatnot. Uh, but then we have local races and whatnot. So I just speak a little bit about how you, the three of you see the relationship between sort of larger hot button national issues and how they filter down into local races, whether that be local congressional races or even all the way down to school boards. Sure. The biggest challenge that I have is living in such a wonderful community like Chapel Hill Carborough where most people would define us and say that we're liberal slash progressive, although we have a wide range of folks here, but generally that's the take. And so how do we get people engaged? Because everybody assumes everybody has the best intentions and we're all, we all think the same way. We don't like banning books, right? We don't like attacks on the teachers and thinking that they don't know how to make the right decision for what's going on in the classroom. But we have to be mindful that in the midst of this amazing, beautiful community, that there are so many inequities that are happening, even in our school system here. I hope you all know that for as great as our school system is, Chapel Hill Carborough school system, we're like number one, two, or three with the worst achievement gap or opportunity gap in the country, right here. So who is it working for? It's working for some, but not all. And so we have wonderful candidates that run for school board in different positions, but then how do you connect that with, look at the inequities. So we don't have to put, point to Arkansas or to Mississippi or to other places and say, look how terrible they are. Wish they were like Chapel Hill Carborough. We have this issue right here. And so can we speak to our candidates? Can we speak to elected officials and say, we need to address the inequities that are happening right here? National matters, absolutely, but those same things are happening right here. And so we have to get people to realize that we have to be engaged and we have to um, certainly enjoy the comfortableness that we all have here, but also understand that this is uncomfortable. And it's really uncomfortable for those who are not enjoying the finer things that happen here in Chapel Hill Carborough. So I see the connectivity is very, very strong. We have extra work to do here because we live in this so-called bubble and, and, and cocoon. The other thing that I enjoy calling out, and I guess it's not for some of my colleagues at UNC, is that we have one of the best schools of education right here in Chapel Hill. UNC Chapel Hill, the School of Education. And yet it's probably no more than six, seven miles from any of the schools in Chapel Hill Carborough school system. And yet we have outcomes like we have. So what's the connection? How can the, our, the university system do better to help our local schools? And sometimes we point to Bertie County and other counties and say, oh, look at the poverty there. Look at the poor outcomes there. We have, um, we have worse inequities in many ways than Bertie County. That's my connection. They're grappling less with achievement gap data, and I mean they 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 well, better. Still very much a, still very much an issue, and especially since they're a, a slightly more rural school system. But they are grappling with the national issues when it comes to having that split among the community and parents and school board members when it comes to the buzzwords of critical race theory and certain books that are in the library. Like you do see these national issues certainly bubble down and, and sometimes they start, they all start at the local level and then they raise the national issue and become kind of a, that calling card that we are also used to hearing now. Um, it was very much part of the candidacy pool that we saw for the Orange County School Board's race during the primary election of some parents running on their, their main policy issue was just rebuilding trust in the school system. And there are a lot of reasons why that trust can be broken and I think that is, that is fair, but um, if, if you're looking at the main reason being, you know, what books are available in a library for kids to read, that can be a little concerning. Again, that gets back to, you know, as, as the news director, our job is to focus on what the policy issues are, focus on what the issues can be and when 
candidates are running on something as shallow as that, sometimes it can be a little surprising. A little surprising. But to answer your question, like it, you certainly see what happens on the national level trickle down to the local. I think looking at our current uh, amount of local races that we're, that we're seeing on the ballot right now, a little bit less so for state representatives and, and the folks representing immediately Chapel Hill and Carborough in this cycle. Yeah, there's a, been a trend of, of nationalization of our politics that's been going on for a couple of decades. It used to be quite common for communities to vote, say, one way for the, for the presidency and, and completely differently for Congress or, or other, other things, and that has largely gone away. And I think there's, there's two main reasons for that. One is it has become a strategy of political elites to try to nationalize things. It's in some ways a more efficient strategy. You know, you can talk about critical race, you, you can talk, you may not have to know what even it is, but you can talk about it mm -hmm. in every community in the country and, and perhaps someone will understand at least the buzzword you're trying to talk about. And so it's, it's easier for, for political activists to talk that way. But then the, the second part of it, and I, I guess I'd like Brighton's point of view on this, is that the decline of local media throughout the, yes. throughout the country has made that, it made it much more difficult to even know what the local issues are. There just aren't, the, the daily newspapers have, have by and large gone away. Local news coverage has, budgets have shrunk dramatically. I mean, it's it's incredibly difficult even in this community. You know, I remember a school board race here in, in Chapel Hill Carver a couple of years ago where I could find no in, no objective information about what the people running for school board stood for other than their own websites. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's challenging for people who want to be more local to even do so because that, that vacuum has been filled by national politics. And so I think those, those two things are interconnected. They re reinforce each other. So um, on the level of state legislatures and those t uh, type of races, can you differentiate what makes, um, what are the salient issues, or is it all national all the way down through? Or uh, Are you seeing any differences with salient issues for North Carolina or for local uh more local or statewide races as opposed to national races and i guess i would jason i'll start with you extrapolating that sort of nationally or is it just really national politics across the board well i think it's hard for candidates to break through and, and get their local message out uh, you know if someone came to me and said i want to go and read about all the state legislative races around me and, and what the issues are in those races i'm not sure what i would tell them there, there, it's just, it's not, it's not something that people, we talk about it in terms of, oh, well, there could be a supermajority or not. It, it's more of a macro level kind of thing. But I think it's really hard for candidates to break through on the, on the issues these days. But again, I would, well, let's defer to the expert here on, on media coverage. Well, I, I think that, I think that it varies from candidate to candidate. I think it's easy when there is somebody who has been in the state legislature to easily speak to what some of the big issues on the state level are. Also, if somebody is very connected to their constituency, they normally can go right to the source of what matters most. I do think, say, in North Carolina, in these most recent races, when we talked with candidates ahead of this election cycle, we heard a lot about housing. We heard a lot about education funding. Of course, the Leandro case being back in the news, as it always seems to be when it comes to school funding, is a, is a big, big talking point of a lot of candidates in this cycle. Clean energy also a talking point of many candidates in, in, in some of the local races here and in North Carolina where there's kind of a, a not, not necessarily a struggle but certainly a push from the governor to try and focus on clean energy and maybe less so from, from the legislature itself. So I do think that you do see some more state specific issues from the folks who are used to being in the state legislature for people who are just trying to break through, for people who are maybe running because they're just not necessarily pleased with how things are going or how they're represented. Sometimes it is a little surprising when you hear a state legislature candidate say, I'm, you know, I want to improve gas prices. Not entirely sure how you do that for North Carolina specifically, but um, it, it, you do see some of those national issues and not every single candidate is going to be focused on focused on those, but they're certainly they're certainly intertwined. And I mean, to, to build off of Jason's point, it, it in my mind, it is the local media's responsibility to make sure that their, our own readership, our own audience, community constituency is helping project what those local issues are, whether it's just within your community or when it comes to the state level, providing that context for voters and making sure that that is a focus on coverage instead of just what maybe the easiest thing to talk about is, is a critical part of 
election coverage and certainly a critical part of our election coverage when it comes to Orange County. As a resident in trying to make decisions in terms of how I'm going to vote, I don't see much difference between local and national. Hmm. I really don't. I think the candidates, they campaign with that big, that big area, whether it's environment, whether it's education, whether it's health care. And that's the way they go. That's, the, that's what's going to create attention. It's going to create interest. It's going to draw people to their website. And certainly, uh, I can't believe we've gone this far without having discussing the effect of President Trump in, in MAGA, right? Um, and I think player, I think politicians, it doesn't take very long. I don't know how many questions it takes or how many clicks you have to do on their website to see where they are on one side or the other, and that's national. And so even though your community, like a Chapel Hill Carborough, is pretty much, you know, blue, you can still see that, camp, that people will campaign to say, I am not that, right, the other. I, I, even though you kind of know it's not necessary, but still, they make that statement. So the connection I, is there. I think we'll definitely be touching on some of the threats to democracy that we might be seeing, especially when Jason mentioned about the poll workers and whatnot, just so you know, the basic infrastructure of how we do voting. I want to go back to something, uh, I'm getting a little ring. I want to go back to something that you said, um, uh, Debbie, about the, uh, about, we have these very local issues that are not being attended to, uh, through our political process. And to the extent that, um, some of this has to do with complacency and that we are in a demographic, there is either demographic sorting, there's all sorts of other reasons why um, people are sorted, whether it be gerrymandering. I'm just curious about how that is affecting our overall appreciation for the electoral process. The idea that, you know, red states are red states and will always be red states. So what does that mean if you're a blue voter in a red state? What does that do to your appreciation for democracy? What recourses do you have to make a difference through civic engagement? And the same thing, you know, even in blue areas like this one where you're talking about issues that are not being addressed through the political process and through, the, through our civic engagement, uh, perhaps because there's some complacency that we all agree with each other and everyone's voting the right way. So just... Uh, maybe you could uh, speak a little bit about demographic sorting, the idea of political identity, and how do we be effective if we have either through complacency or through just we, if your vote doesn't really matter, how does that affect our civic engagement? Well, if I should speak to this, because uh, being a senior citizen now, I'm just like whatever <laughs> to everything, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I go back to the history, and, and again, that this is a democratic experiment. And I don't think the experiment is working very well. Not if you look at the research and, and you look at the outcomes of all Americans. I don't think this democracy is working. In fact, I call it an oligarchy, right? Uh, those with the, the money win. And I'm not talking about somebody who makes $300,000 or 500. I'm talking about your billionaires. I believe they are running this country. They're running this world. And democracy is, is not their goal at all. And it's become more clear to me over the past five years. I really believe that. Now, in terms of the electoral process, we saw what happened. We felt what happened. I mean, it was just a major attack on what we put on paper that we're trying to be and trying to, to do. So uh, I'm very hopeful, but I don't believe the way we're structured right now really is including and, and having people belong to the so-called United States. I, I just don't see it right now. Yes, could you speak to uh, this issue of sort of demographic sorting or some yes. people's sense of the futility of voting or? I mean, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna buy into the argument that it's, that it's futile to vote, but I mean, politics are dynamic. I think people should keep that in mind. That, uh, you know, ask any candidate if, if voters ever change their mind and if, if communities ever change, they'll tell you the stories. But to, to sorting, I think this has become an issue in our society that people are increasingly geographically sorting themselves into neighborhoods of people who look and think like them. And the, the thing that is happening as a result of that is that we're developing what political scientists now call this thing called effective partisanship, where it's not so much that someone is a strong Democrat or a strong Republican, it's that they think that the other people are horrible. They, they, it's not so much, I'm so much more Republican than I used to be. It's like, I hate the Democrats more than I used to hate them because they're horrible people is how people view the world now. 
And I think th the biggest reason this is the case is because people don't interact with people who aren't like them. If you, you know, I, I, I had my students do this, you know, say so go out and talk to someone who disagrees with you on an issue and write about it. I want to hear that, like, just go talk to someone that you disagree with. Ask them why they disagree with you. Where are they coming from? Where are you coming from? Have a conversation. You're going to find out that even when you disagree with people, they're often not horrible people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are horrible people in the world. I'm not saying that. But just because someone disagrees with you politically doesn't mean that they're, that, and they may not disagree with you on everything uh, to do with politics. And so I think, you know, this is a real challenge where we live. This is a bubble. Um, you know, I hear people talking even around here. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who think the same way and they think everyone thinks the way they think. And that, that makes people even more, more sure that their point of view is the correct one. And the people who don't agree with them are even more wrong than they think they thought they were before. And it's, it's horrible. I mean, if, if I could do one thing, I'd make people just go, you know, go find people who are, you know, let's randomly put people together and make them go talk. And I think you'd find that, you know, people are dealing with the same issues, you know, whether it's gas prices or education or anything else. That affects all people. And, and we really need to, to find a way in our society to, to get out of our bubbles, whether they're, they're physical or, or virtual or online or whatever they are, and, and cross-pollinate more with, with one another. Sorry, I didn't mean to get into a preaching no. mode there, but that's that's what we really, it's really destructive that we don't respect people we disagree with more. And, and that's, that's really why when it comes to, you know, what do you, what do you need to know coming into this election or what should you keep in mind? Like, to me, it is simply doing your best to be informed and indeed listening to all the candidates. It's not going to be easy if you have already made up your mind or if you know where you stand on certain issues. But at the same time, it also may give you an indication maybe more overlap than than one would think and it is more of a test i think of oneself of being able to be like okay can i actually sit through this <laughs> can i can i actually make sure that i'm doing my due diligence in listening to both sides listening to all sides that are available uh, when we were recording candidate introductions part of our local election coverage is that we play introductions from the candidates in our local races on the air leading up to early voting. We were recording one and a Republican candidate said to me after we turned off the microphones, he was like, you know, I was actually, I was down in, in, in Chapel Hill and was, was talking with prospective voters and found that we had a lot of issues that we did overlap on, especially when it came to clean energy and when it came to funding schools. And I, I, I thought the way that he phrased it was funny. He was like, so does that just mean that all these social issues are the, are the problem? And I was like, well, considering what some of, when you, when you, what you group into social issues these days, yes, because there are a whole lot of things that I think people feel very desperate on both sides are, are being threatened, rightfully so. Um, I, I do think that conversations though need to be need to be had between those in order to maybe not necessarily find common ground but at least try and push your boundaries as a voter and find ways then to push your community's boundaries to you know instead of just writing off what one side has to say at least try and figure out maybe the best way to move forward continue to build those constructive dialogues what i'll add to that though is where you stand often depends on where you sit and so for some people who've been harmed by candidates, by politicians, by those in power, you can't sit and talk to folks. That's true. Because it's traumatizing. When you know that that person, their vote or their power is causing harm to you, to your family, to your community, as in mental health, physical health. I mean, the, the research is very clear. Dr. Arlene Geronimus at Michigan with the allostatic load and the weathering of the body, the, the stress that's happening. Dr. Sherman James at Duke, you know, this work is, it's not just, oh, I don't like what he's saying, as in it's causing you harm to the point where you can't work, you can't exist, you can't love your, uh, your partner, your friend, your, your parents. That's where we have to say, whoa, with the conversation. There's some things that you just can't, you can't take it anymore. And I think, again, because of our positions of being in a very comfortable, loving, beautiful community, that we don't necessarily see how people are being harmed. And it takes them a lot to even get out of bed each and every day, to get in the car and go to a place of employment where you're being ignored, not appreciated. 
you know, we have to think about that. I appreciate that. What I'd like to do now is to open up the floor to, this is a community conversation, so we're going to start by handing the microphone over to Bob Kuykendall. I'm curious from a media point of view, you described the local issues being hard to get, you know, what people actually think. For me as a voter, the hardest thing is to figure out judges. It, it's where I feel the least informed. And I can't tell whether I think judges ought to be elected versus but then when I look at the Supreme Court, I don't want that either. So uh, I'm trying to figure out how do you, as a media person particularly, give information about judges where there's so, you know, we don't want to prejudge anything and all that noise. That's a, I think that's a great question, question. And very candidly, that's the biggest shortcoming in our coverage that I am aware of almost every single election cycle. When, when it comes to the ones that we're able to dedicate our time to, it's usually the races that have more people's attention, which, I mean, we, we then get emails from, from judges being like, what about us? I, it's, it's very, very important when it comes to listening to what the judges have to say, reading their campaigns, and it's challenging from the media perspective to make sure that those, that those voices are included, but it is important too. When it comes to us, it goes back to the, the challenges that local media faces. You know, my, my team, we're, we're small but mighty. We do our best to, to get to everyone, and, and that's the one that usually sticks out in my mind as we do need to do more when it comes to our, when it comes to our local judges. Um, I, I want to shout out Duke University. They just did a, a great debate with the state Supreme Court uh, candidates in the last week and a half or so, and I think having more of those events, trying to make them more visible and, and making sure that that they are kind of front and center when it comes to all these rest of the, the races, when it comes to congressional or if you're looking at a state representative or when it comes to county judges, county district attorneys, that's incredibly important too. And, and most of what's there is just, you know, platitudes. I mean, it, it doesn't tell you anything. It's true, and it is more challenging. You know, judges, I, I believe, on the local level serve six-year terms. So when they're elected, they're elected for, for a while. And it's also very frequent, I think, to see them not be running opposed on the local level as well. I, I, I think there's not a very clear answer to it from the media side. More coverage is simply needed and more conversations with them is needed, but it is also tricky since they ride this interesting line of being partisan elections when they're supposed to be impartial decision makers. Um, we have a question here. Chris Orr. Um, I was just reading something today from Heather Richardson who brought to mind the idea that People think elections are about policies, but they really aren't. They are referenda on the incumbents. And that certainly seems to be the way it's playing out at the national level in terms of the political take on everything. To what extent do you think that flows through to local politics? That is a common way that, that people vote. I mean, the, the world's complicated. People are busy. They often don't have time to, to, to have a full set of, of information about all the policies in front of them. So I think a lot of the way people vote, as they say, are, you know, Ronald Reagan said this in, in the 1980 closing argument of his campaign. He says, are, you know, ask yourself this question. Are you better off than you were four years ago? If you are, vote for Carter. If you're not, vote for me. And, but I think that, that can apply. That does apply at the local level. I mean, again, I'll, I'll just. I'm thinking about whether these people who are the, the political parties, basically, not just individuals who use that because they can do something about the incumbents, but they don't know about the issues and they don't have time. I'm just asking about the structure of the political apparatus and to what extent that deliberate, specific approach of backbiting, who cares what, you know, really bothered having policy, to what extent does that structurally slow down in the political system? Greatly. Yeah. Greatly. Because the example is President Biden, even though he's had some, what some of us would consider wins, uh, that's why you have President Barack Obama on the trail now. Because the structure actually is saying that uh, incumbents are having, that's a difficult um, one to overcome, so let's bring in our superstar. What I mean is at the local one. Those right. But I'm saying there, President Obama is going local, right? He's meeting with people locally. In order for that to happen, the local Democratic Party, the local Republican Party has to support all of them. So yes, it's all the way from national to local. 
I think uh, one example that might answer your question that I have is actually from my home county uh, from the 20, yeah, 20, what, it, what, what, what year is this? <laughs> 2022. 2022. I believe it was in the 2020 elections where it was the county commissioners were running. Two of the county commissioners for the longest time were registered Republicans. They decided to run as unaffiliated. They, they had served for many, many years on the county commission. They decided to run as unaffiliated because they were not pleased with how the Republican Party was being represented on a national level. And they built up big local campaigns saying, you guys have known us for years. We have represented you. We've done a whole lot for this county for many, many years. And they got steamrolled in the election, voted out and, and were replaced by two Republicans running on a much more nationally focused, nationally aligned campaign. To, so to, to answer your question, I think it does, it does align very much so. Here, I, do, I don't think it, ma it, it matches up quite as much when you look at town council races, the Orange County Board of Elections races. But again, we're, we're not exactly your typical community on, on that front. I do, think, I, th I do think, especially in North Carolina and probably on a larger scale, you, you do see a lot of those national examples uh, fall through when it comes to the local governments, which uh, you know, is very challenging when you have so many local issues that can be different even from the national ones. Questions in the, from the in-house audience? Lloyd. So I have a question about why so many people don't want to vote. Um, and especially young people. I, I've tracked this vote tracker thing. Do you all know this thing? The Civitas, it shows every day how many people have voted in our state. And they have a graph that shows the age of the voters. And it starts, it's like a, a bell curve. It's down here, the 20 to 30, and then gradually, and it gets up to about 67 to 75. <laughs> There's a huge bubble. The majority of the people who are voting are quite old, to be honest which I think is a great group of people, by the way. I appreciate them more every... But, like, I, I teach at the university, and I'm forever saying to students, you need to get out and vo go vote. I mean, I'm not giving a partisan speech, but go vote. And a lot of students will say things like, it doesn't matter who wins, even though everybody I talk to vehemently disagree. You know, like, the judges, the policies, the, the school board election, everything matters. And yet... The, the struggle people have had to create a democracy over the last two centuries, why do so many people absolutely have no interest in voting? That we, you know, they're bombarded, go out and vote, go out and vote. There are signs there, go vote, no matter what. 40 to 45 percent of the population won't even vote. What's your answer to that problem? A lot of research on this, and it's 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 nothing. It's not new. I mean, for as long as we've had data on who votes, younger the younger group of voters has been the the lowest performing group in terms of turnout. They've done better. I mean, in in, in twenty twenty was the first time that the eighteen to twenty four year old crowd crossed the fifty percent turnout threshold. So I, I I told my students this morning. I said, congratulations, you guys got over that threshold. Now the the seventy five and older crowd was over eighty percent. So you're still get. I says, so your grandparents are still kicking your butt by thirty points. So you know why is that? And and you know, I hear the same responses from students all the time. They say, well, we're too busy. And I say, look, I'm I have two small children and I'm, I work a full time job and so does my wife and I'm running here, there, and everywhere. You guys don't even know what it means to be busy. Like, <laughs> try again. <laughs> But they do feel a sense of, of disaffection. I think that that you know they don't. You know, they say they they're not experienced in the world. They're not paying taxes. They're not buying a house. They're not you know doing these kinds of things that they don't have kids in the public schools. The kinds of things that might motivate people. They're often transient. You know they don't live in one place as consistently as you do when you're older. I mean when, you know I remember when I was in my twenties I once lived in seven uh, seven addresses in seven years. Now I've lived in the same place for fifteen years. I mean that you don't get as a good a community ties then. The voter registration can be difficult because you're moving all the time. Um, but I do think they think that it, it, there is a sense they think it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know how you get them to, to see that if you voted, it would matter. Because I do, I go through the consequences with them. I'm like, you know, the, earlier this year I was teaching about Congress and you know, I had a student ask me, he said, why is everyone who's running Congress 80 years old? I said, that's a really good question. And it's because you guys don't vote. I mean, you know, 80-year-olds do. 
And so, yeah, I said, we have a gerontocracy because that's who votes. We have, you know, the, if you look at the federal, U.S. federal budget, it's essentially, we are a, as I tell people, that the, the U.S. government is, is, is old people's programs and an army. That's 70% that's of the federal budget. Why is that? Because I'm looking around this room, these people vote. And so they, they get what they ask for. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. And I think civic education is part of it. I think history, people understanding history, I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, would, would be part of it. Um, but it's, it's a conundrum that, that it's hard to solve. Points around how democracy is not working, right? We don't have civics classes anymore. We don't teach it. People don't know the history and how it all got started. And then the more recent data says that they were so frustrated with the Clinton-Trump election, how they got so excited, they engaged, they did all these different things, and then they lost. And they just said this, is, it's almost like ripping their heart out for them, especially for many of them, it's their first time ever voting. And they just don't see it. And so again, that's our work as the older folks to connect them to the inequities, to connect them to how you want to see people your age in office. You know, uh, that's our work. Yeah. How much of this might be related to it? Something we talked about earlier: the sense that it's not really, it doesn't really matter if you vote because things are so, you know, like. People are like, oh, I live in Vermont. It doesn't really matter if I vote because it's all going to be progressive anyway. Or I live in Chapel Hill and everyone in Chapel Hill is going to vote the same way. Does that have any bearing on disaffection among young mm -hmm. folks? We're not connecting the dots to the things that are happening, that it does affect you in Vermont. What happens in Chapel Hill will affect someone across the state or in another state. We're not doing that connecting. Which is so interesting because you have, I, I think a lot of folks understand that when you have social media and you have the world at your fingertips, you can make those connections easier than before. But going back to what Jason said too, it also means that, it also means that you can build your own echo chamber. You can just be around the folks who you want to be around or read information that you want to read or in some people's cases, completely disassociate. If something upsets you, if something challenges what you know if something makes you sad if you know you can just move away from that if you need to you can just keep scrolling move to something else and um i think that's a big challenge but i you know lack of perspective lack of patience it's a big part of it um and i think i think a big part of it too is ambivalence is trendy as silly as that sounds like it's very you know the the, the whole thing is to to maybe not care about it as much also part of the you know the effect of having social media at, at your fingertips is being acutely aware of disasters all the time sometimes things that don't necessarily immediately affect your day to day you might not necessarily connect the dots to what's happening in Ukraine or uh, what's happening in Iran but you notice it you 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 empathize with it but you also feel helpless in terms of what can I do on a day to day to try and affect any change and eventually it just you know, it becomes tough to figure out what you want to do to operate and then make a, make a tangible change on your own level, whether that's in local elections or national elections. It reminds me of a podcast I was listening to about the challenges with Florida and what's going to happen due to Hurricane Ian and how the insurance companies are basically pulling back, saying we can't afford to insure the state. And so that's going to affect housing in terms of who can buy there who will be able to stay there, because once they get their new premium going up, and then where are these people going to go? That's going to affect us in North Carolina, right? So how are we connecting those dots when we think about the insurance industry being ripped from its roots in terms of where they want to insure and how that affects all the other systems? We have some questions here. I'll start. To what extent do, do you as a panel think that um, with respect to the party apparatus itself at the national level, at the state level, um, that that too has become sort of uber-nationalized so that the behavior of individual candidates at the local level is really controlled because it's all being connected to the money flow, which is increasingly, it's my impression, being funneled through the national party apparatus. I mean, I look at North Carolina, and the leadership for the Democratic Party in North Carolina is ossified. It's like me. I mean, the people my age. 
instead of the next generation who might be candidates, and then at your generation, um, the people who would be grown into candidates. So why don't we start with you because the point about nationalization of politics, but, but the party apparatus itself, how do you evaluate we, that? In some ways it's gotten harder for the party apparatus to control what's going on. I mean, this is a soapbox of mine, but the primary process you know, that, that we go about selecting candidates through is bizarre. There, there's no other organization that any of us are a member of that we would let someone who's maybe not even a member of our group select who's going to represent us. I mean, I asked my students that. I'm like, if I, could I come vote in your sorority election? They're like, well, of course not. I'm like, well, then why do we let people who aren't Democrats, who aren't Republicans pick who their, their candidates are going to be? It, it's crazy when you think about it. And I think that has led to that plus the Citizens United decision has in some ways opened up the money flow. It's, it's just the opposite. Outside money can, can flow without party control. You can, you can run a campaign if you have a, a benefactor. You don't have to have the party blessing. Um, and so I think that has led to some candidates running under, under both parties' labels that the parties are embarrassed by. And there's not anything they can really do about it because of this, of this primary system we're in. Um, and so, I, I mean, in my opinion, if you went back to give the parties more control over their product they put out there, we might actually end up with, you know, Right. I mean, the parties who want to win, they'd be trying to put candidates out there who could who could get votes broadly. I mean, it's it's not unlike, you know, the way I teach this in class, not unlike Apple or anyone else. They're going to try to put out a product that people want to buy. Um, but you know, you know, we don't we don't vote as a you don't have non you don't have people who don't work for Apple voting on what's going to be on the iPhone. <laughs> they decide and then they put it out there and you either buy it or you don't, and and that disciplines them in a way that that our current system doesn't really do. We get we have people getting involved in politics who. You know, I don't think are to the to the benefit of it. Question here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back real quick regarding uh, young people. Um, I think that they're being overstimulated in many ways um, on both sides, both parties, um, and how politics play out in schools today. I see our teachers becoming much more. Um, uh, polarized uh, that we're suff the children are suffering because we're forgetting that they're children and that they need to uh, have a, a, a you know a form of education where they're not feeling like they're being forced to take a side or being forced to talk about adult subjects when they're still learning how to learn arithmetic you know, in third grade or second grade. I think we're doing uh, an, an incredible injustice to human development and child development uh, to, with our kids. And now they're growing up and they've been forced into um, different mindsets that maybe they just don't, they don't agree with and they don't know how to uh, communicate that and the peer pressure and all those things, you know, make a difference. Uh, in our in our children, and I think because they're overstimulated and it's very emotionally charged, we're turning them into young activists way early that they're just checking out. They have their own group. They look at social media. They get what they need. They're playing their games, you know, and uh, they're they're just checking out. So I I think that that's what's um, contributing to a low voter turnout for for younger generation. Respond to that. Um, I, I think that I think that some of the folks that you see that are <coughs> the younger folks that you see that are very charged want to be. I think some of them feel the desperation of certain situations and say, "Well, they they look at the system and they say, well, if it's not been working for X, Y, and Z amount of years, then what's going to happen mm -hmm. when I'm here for <laughs> however many more decades that I am?" And it's it's. I actually think that there are a lot of, when you say maybe the, the activists' ages are getting younger, I think that's by choice. I don't think that's necessarily by the systems that, that are put in place, education system pushing folks that way. Um, I do think that you, I, I do think that it is maybe a product of social media, of the connections that they can make, of finding communities earlier or having exposure to issues that they, that they 
wouldn't have before. And, you know, I think sometimes it could be seen as it's pushed upon them. But I do think a lot of them make up their minds from their own volition and say, this is a, a, a cause that I feel very, very passionate about. You go to climate change rallies here in Chapel Hill, you see kids who are you know, I mean, 13, 14 years old who are leading and organizing the rallies because they say, this is the planet that I'm going to inherit. We want to try and push and make that change now. Um, you see a lot of kids speaking on when it comes to education. Uh, you see a lot of kids speaking when it comes to, to funding it. They, they, they're passionate about it because they want to be, but it is interesting how they certainly aren't reflective of all, everybody their age. And I do think, again, I, the ambivalence is, is trendy kind of comment I made. I think that goes back to they might not necessarily be seen as leaders among their peers. They could be seen as someone who is a little extreme on that side, as these other people are developing their own thoughts on certain issues and maybe aren't quite there yet. And if somebody is feels feels like they're being pressured by their peer to think one way or another because somebody is very passionate about it, what do kids do? They want to rebel. They, they, they want to then reject whatever you know, upsets them in some sort of way and say, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that or I'm, I'm not going to vote because I am being bombarded by all of the signs and everybody telling me that I need to participate in this way. You know, I, 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 don't, think it's, I don't think it's one or the other. I don't know if there's a specific you know, one causation or, or the next, but um, you, know, you, can, you can have it both sides where there is certainly a large group of young voters who are a little apathetic and then you have some that are that feel like they are pushed to say something and to act a certain way because they feel moved to they feel uh they feel like they need to be the ones who go ahead and take up the reins and if I could specifically to racial matters you don't have to wait until your loved one is in high school or college to talk about race or racism the research is very clear that children are aware of racial bias by ages three to five. I read a report last year about children at age two choosing playmates by race. They're doing research on six month old babies, their responses to race by measuring cortisol levels and length of stare. And so if anything, we need to be more engaged and help them to process. This is not about making people comfortable, right? And in fact, when you think about when do we teach compassion and empathy, it's when you're little. And so these are the opportunities to be open because they feel it. They know it. They know what's going on. We have to engage with young people. And because of social media and access to technology, it's not even the curriculum that the teacher might be presenting them. They could go home and get on YouTube and Internet and Google and find things out. For better or worse. For better or worse. And then we all know, at least in my experience, there were certain teachers that I absolutely loved and adored. And if I see my teacher in a position where he or she feels harmed or hurt and can't go through their syllabus, their, their uh, lesson plan, then the children feel that. And so they might respond. Now, a good teacher is going to try to say, you know, Joey, you know, stay over there. I'm handling something and this and that. But children feel us. They feel us. And what's happening right now to teachers all across the nation, it is terrible, the attack on them. They've been trained, they've been certified, they've been licensed to do this work and to think that all of a sudden their excellence doesn't matter. That's my point on this. Okay. I've been voting since 1968 when I cast my first vote for Howard Lee. And I've never seen the toxicity that there is now, uh, the demonization of the other side, yeah. and the, I actually despair when you talk about democracy, when you have the former president <coughs> leading the march, and how, how do we, how do we deal with, with, uh, I mean, I'm showing my politics here, but, but how do you deal with, with the crazies out there? I mean, that's, that's the only thing I can describe it as, uh, the people won't accept their, the results of the election, who, uh, uh, demonize the other side. It's not just they disagree, they demonize the other person. And that's frightening. So, w there may not be an answer to this, but w w what do you see, uh, we'll all know what the elections are like in 10 days, but, but uh, what the results are. But I, 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 I lose confidence in our system. 
challenge of our times how to how to get people to to back off this a little bit um, I mean you know I, I never thought I would say to, to people that what I really want out of the next election is for everybody to accept the outcome and whether, whether you're disappointed in it or not is a different question altogether but to accept the outcomes and that's a problem we face uh, and I think so, you know education is part of it I mean you know, you mentioned the people who were disaffected because they were unhappy with 2016. We need to teach people that's part of that's part of democracy. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and you know, just because you lose doesn't mean it's someone else's fault. It doesn't mean that you should take your ball and go home. You know, work harder next time I, is is the answer. But it's I don't know. I mean, the the, the unique problem we face now with with the with the with the, the things that the the former president is able to to say and the, the way people believe that without asking questions about it they just believe it is is a unique challenge of our times and you know we see it in the in the voting systems now where people are, are angry first they assume the worst first and they ask questions later i mean you know, come watch come watch the board of elections work my colleague Shawnee is here I mean, it's it's like watching paint dry but come watch us you know i mean don't assume that bad things are happening. Come get involved. Learn about it. It's never been easier to learn the truth about things now and how things actually work. But you know, we have people who are who are you know not willing to to probe and think critically about these kinds of things. I mean, the, you know, when, when I have someone tell me that all the elections are stolen, and I'm like, well, then why do different people win all the time? <laughs> you know, think through the logic of that for a minute. If I was going to rig the election, my person would win every time. <laughs> So, I mean, think through that and think through, think through how that would work. You know, it's, it, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm babbling, so hopefully you guys have something intelligent to say. I don't, I'm not sure I do. Well, I, I mean, I think, the, I think the right answer is that there's no immediate answer because there's not been in this country quite anything like this before, where it is a convergence of many things happening at once. Uh, you know, the, I feel like the best way I can speak onto this is just simply like from the, from the local media side. You know, we're thankful that... The majority of our coverage is of the community. It is not necessarily of what is happening on, on the national level. But, you know, we, we face our fair share of challenges of people coming to us with stories or there being things happening out in the community where there's a threat of misinformation that, that might be going through it or a misunderstanding or confusion. Sometimes it's not necessarily malicious. Sometimes it is. And in my mind, the way that we sort through that and how we cover those things from the local media perspective is trying to make sure that if you know something is patently false, it's figuring out the best way to present information to your readers and audience without necessarily giving a falsity any sort of, uh, lifting up any sort of falsity that isn't necessary, while also still providing context and holding people accountable. Because if you ignore something that is said by somebody important, well, that you know, at, we're at the point in society where the people who support whatever information that is are still going to hear it, still going to take it up themselves. To me, it's the local media's job to provide context to the audience and try and call it out when the, on the carpet when you see it without necessarily giving something an unnecessarily high uh, validation by reporting it as this person said this. It, it's more drilling down to, you know, what, what are the issues here? Where is this coming from? and what is important, what is important for our audience to know, instead of just going for what's gonna get us the most web traffic, social media engagement, what's gonna get people talking. The hard thing for, for people in your business is that you're not trained necessarily to deal with the environment we're in now. You're trained to like, we're, we're supposed to provide information to people. If a candidate said this, another candidate said that. You're not trained to write, so-and-so said this today, and that was a bald-faced lie. <laughs> you know? but, yeah. but in some ways, that's what we need, and it, I don't know how you, how you do that and keep your journalistic norms to say this this person said something that was absolutely bonkers today and you need to know that i think it, i think it's challenging too especially when you look at more the you know the media landscape and what what gets people's attention when it what helps you turn a profit it's controversy it is always controversy so you you're right i you know it, it is tricky and again i'm thankful that on on the local level we're we're covering things within our community and i think we can we can cut through that noise a little bit more but it is absolutely a challenge to how do you present that information with the right context and still, and also then convincing, you know, whatever readers are out there that what you're saying is, is true because people used to get their information from 
X amount of sources, a very finite amount of sources. And now you can go to anywhere and find an answer to almost anything or a headline for almost any topic. And people might believe that instead. So it's certainly Pro a challenge. Prove the earth is flat, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, this is uh, related to this question of distrust and demonization. Um, David Scott is concerned about uh, one party control of Congress, SCOTUS, and the presidency. Um, and to the extent that that would sort of put us in a post-democracy type of uh, polity, uh, could you speak to the whether that's a concern or how do we handle this idea of minority rule uh, that is just structurally possible with the Electoral College or with gerrymandering or other ways in which we, we seem to have a system that doesn't uh, necessarily reflect the dem demography behind it um, and that this can then, of course, increase distrust of the system and all that. Can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, the risk of living in a post-democratic society, um, how do we get out of it, and what are the ramifications if that is, in fact, what we're heading towards? Well, the, you know, the, one of the more depressing things you have to teach people when you, when you teach this kind of thing is there's a, a, a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Arrow who won the Nobel Prize for, for demonstrating that there is no voting system out there that'll, that'll generate an outcome that has some properties we would all agree that we want. And so any kind of system we adopt is going to have trade-offs in it. And, you know, the way our current system is constructed, it has a lot of trade-offs in it. And the way politics is structured today, those trade-offs, in some cases, work against the, the Democratic Party. Um, and so what do you do about that? Well, one thing is to remember that politics is dynamic. Things change, and things change rapidly. Um, you know, if you look at something like the Electoral College and how that translates votes into to outcomes, you know, one or two states that right now are, are fairly, you know, lean Republican, if they switch to leaning Democrat, suddenly you've got an Electoral College that, that has a disproportionate advantage for Democratic candidates. And so it's, it's not, I guess I would say that there are, there are things out there that, that are, there are structures out there that lead to disproportionate outcomes but those are unlikely to be fixed in the long term. Now, in the short term, that, you know, I'm talking like an economist, right? In the long run, we're all dead, but <laughs> <laughs> there are short-term problems that, that often get solved by, by demographic change, political dynamics, that it, it's, it's, we, have a, we have a real tendency to assume that things are always gonna be the way they are now, and, and our history teaches us that's rarely true. Bob, do you have another question? It's following up on something Dr. Stroman said. Uh, you mentioned about empathy and compassion, which is certainly some core values that I would hold. I'm struck with what it feels like uh, that that has become weakness. You don't want to know what someone else feels and thinks. You want to know right from wrong. You want to know Christian values. You want to know the way it used to be and that the idea of trying to understand the other and walk a mile in their shoes and all that is so being denigrated right now, and I have major concern as to where that path goes. I'm curious if I'm the only one who sees that, or does it look that way to you? And if so, is this one of the things that's gonna swing back? What's gonna happen with that? So I certainly agree with you. And in fact, if I get tied back to your question about what to do with those folks that some would say are crazy, the way I, the way I navigate that is I have to come out of my head, forget the academic, forget the intellect, get out of the brain and go to the heart. This is about heart work. And as much as I'm looking at the brutal facts each and every day about the inequities, in my work I have to go to my spirituality and to my faith and say that in the midst of all this that's going on, I have to see the God seed in everyone. That's the only way I can navigate this. Because there are times when you just look at the research, look at the narratives, and we like to believe that we're a, a data-driven society. We are not. Because the data has been out for decades and decades and decades. We're a narrative-driven society. And in fact, we see that in the business world now in terms of how we get people's attention. It's all about storytelling, right? Everybody has a story. We need to use the videos, do the little short clips. Because we like to think it's all about data, but it's not. And so I have to get into my heart 
and say that even though that person is 100, we just disagree 150%, there's a God seed in that person. And I'm hopeful that maybe it's a movement of God, of the creator, to bring that back. Uh, but I am concerned in terms of this post-democracy. Again, my point is I never thought it was a democracy. But with that being said, uh, looking at the Meredith poll that looks at North Carolina uh, uh, politics, they said that over, I think about 34% of North, Carolina, North Carolinians believe that there's a possibility in the near future of a civil war, of a civil war. Now, I don't know if we're necessarily saying, you know, armed and all that, but I'm saying the divide is that, that thick and that heavy on us that we're concerned that will we come back together? Can we find that space where we can all, you know, even if it's more blue or if it's more red, that we can still work together? This is, this is okay. It's not that extreme. Yeah. Mind it comes back to two things we have touched on, which is kind of the, the investment in youth, right? I think if you're, if, if, as long as you are working with folks and, and raising folks to be able to keep those things in mind and, and to know that that is an important way to go day to day, it's a, big, it's a big game changer. But beyond that too, I think it goes back to how people are getting their information, whether they decide to push themselves to be reading things, exploring things that they either don't know or that they don't maybe immediately agree with, to explore perspectives that are not their own. And I think that is a good practice that eventually breathes compassion and sympathy and, and understanding because you hopefully start to see where, even though there are differences, maybe there are some sort of overlaps. I, I don't think it's an immediate change. I think you can point more toward the media being a big reason why that might have gone away because of how people typically consume their information, how that has changed so rapidly in the last few decades. But um, in order to improve that, I, I think it means that a lot of folks have to push beyond their comfort zone, which is, uh, you know, can be a tall task. We had a, a uh, seminar a, a couple of weeks ago on republics. Then and now, we were grappling with this issue of, you know, republican government as and small r republican government and how its institutions sometimes can sort of stop change from happening. And that it was an interesting comment that Richard Talbert, our, our ancient historian, said that actually was the reason the Roman Republic was founded, was to make sure nothing happened. Um, but in, in the opening of that, we were looking at the New York Times Siena poll. And forgive me for forgetting exactly what the number was, but it was a poll of registered uh, voters. And I know it was in the 70s. I'm going to say 72 percent or something to that effect was were of both Republicans and Democrats. 72 um, percent were concerned for the state of democracy. And yet, of those same, and of course the reasons why one party might be concerned would be very different from the reasons why another party would be concerned. So putting that aside, what I thought was interesting, the follow-up to that was that 81% of the of those 72%, again, our 70s percent, 81% of those people believed that the institutions would eventually take care of this and that we would not have to resort to violence and i'm just wondering if the three of you could comment on that and how you see this idea of faith in institutions but also real lack of faith in each other and, and the good faith of our of our partisan divide say with with a lot of things we see in polling there's a lot of things that don't make sense uh, um, you know our institutions are only as strong as the people who occupy them uh, you know, I think you know, we've seen that time and time again. Uh, I mean, I study institutions. I love institutions. I think they're important, but they're not, they're not self-enforcing and they're not self-reinforcing. Uh, and I, you know, I think it is important to think about what people mean when they say that they think democracy is in danger. You know, it, the, the, the team I, I don't like winning does not mean democracy is falling apart. That, that's just life. Uh, it's when we have people not accepting outcomes and that that's when democracy falls apart. So I think it's important to, to draw that distinction. But, uh, you know, I, I find some of those polls sometimes hard to take a lot from because you just, you know, you don't know what people are, people react to questions whether they've thought about them or not and whether they really have a, an attitude that's meaningful or not. I mean, I know they're fun to talk about and the media love to, you know, nothing probably drives clicks more than some poll or some this, that, and the other. But, you know, whether there's any real meaning behind that is it's hard to say. Makes for a good seminar opening, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts on this idea of faith in institutions to to resolve this? 
I'm just thinking about power. And if indeed there are certain folks who are controlling things and they have the voting power, what if they decide to use their power in a different way? And that being, you know, as it's been said, everybody has a price. And so if they decide to use their money, their economics, to control more and to have more, and to have more greed, and to have more profit, and then can we trust our institutions then? I mean, the country is talking about inflation. I don't know if many people in our country really understand inflation, right? But when I look at inflation and I look at the corporate greed that's taking place and the prices going up for reasons just because of greed, not all of them, but certain, certain industries, it's pretty clear. And especially when we look at oil and thinking about the record-breaking profits that they're making right now, it just makes you wonder, is there some shift in the mentality of those in power to say, I want even more? I want more, and even if it means that some people are going to suffer, that there's going to be more inequities, that's okay because I want more. Then it makes me question institutions. I don't know. I think they're working for some folks, but not most folks. Thoughts, Brayden, at all on institutions? Um, I, I think I think maybe some of that trust goes back to just wanting to find something that is out of their hands to to point to and, and trust to. You know, it is it, it's challenging to look at it from a media perspective because I think the media at large is maybe the institution where there is the least trust at the moment, and it's because there is so many conflicting uh, conflicting. I, I don't want to say conflicting facts. That, that, that doesn't feel right because facts are facts. But conflicting versions of people's stories, convicting, conflicting versions of what happens. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can aptly answer that question in terms of why people do want to find that trust and, and how you move forward. But I know that it, I, I imagine it goes back to you know, hoping, that, hoping that it is ultimately the, you know, the stabilizing outcome. But you can't really get there without a lot of other things being stabilized and figured out along the way. Okay, we have a question here, Lloyd. Well, I want to bring up a historical perspective, if I may, <laughs> about democracy, the fragility of democracy, and how rare it is in the history of the world to have communities where uh, human beings are willing to accept that people who are really different from themselves and their values, their religion, their political views, should be tolerated and accepted. Um, this is truly a challenge for every one of us. I, I, I wanna say that because we all think we're right. <laughs> and human beings have always felt that way. And if you look at the wars of religion, you look at the, the wars of politics, you look at the the wars of between nations, the, the pattern of history has almost always been not to accept the difference of the other, it has been to efface it and to crush it if you can, or at least to disregard it. And even in the United States, as you say, I mean, to say, when were we really a democracy? I mean, maybe after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 till about, <laughs> I mean, because North Carolina was no democracy for the whole of the 20th century till that time or the 19th century. But so this is my question. Are we, are we naive as human beings to assume that we can expect people to believe deeply in their own values and be able to accept. I, I take your point, Jason. Politics should be willing to accept that the people who are different from you won. But if you believe the people who are different from you are fundamentally evil people, as a human being, you cannot accept that. And it's not just in the United States, it's all over the world. And, and this is why I, I grew up assuming democracy was just always gonna be there. And I actually believe we are at a greater threat now of seeing it disappear or be diminished, not only in the United States, but in many countries. Because people simply cannot accept that people who are so different from them should be allowed to win elections. And I know how difficult that is for me, and I, I try to use my reason. I want to be an Enlightenment philosopher. But what do you say about that? It goes against human instincts to accept 
that people who you think are absolutely wrong should have power over you. What do you do about that problem? 91 deniers on the ballots. And so some people say, okay, difference of opinion. But if, if these folks win these elections, right. then they have the power, especially the governor and the secretary of, uh, what's it called? The secretary of state. They can overturn people who won in the election process. And feel so I hear you. And feel justified. Because they're fending off a greater evil. That's right. And not for the It's okay. So, Jason, what are the guardrails? Are there guardrails for this? Um, there are there are people, right? And there are you know there. I mean, it, it's it's a, just to put the last election. You know, people talked about well, okay, maybe these states would. Um, set aside their popular vote and choose their own slate of electors. Now, doing that after you've said we're going to have a popular vote is one thing, but constitutionally, the idea that there's going to be a popular vote for president is not not there. I mean, if, if North Carolina wanted to pass a bill today and say we're going to, the legislature is going to pick our electors henceforth, that's, I mean, you can say that's anti-democratic, but it's it's legitimate in the sense that it's it's legal under the Constitution that we've all adopted and live under. So, you know, why doesn't that happen then? You know, I, I do think that the that, that people in power do fear p public backlash to things like that. Um, you know, it, I think there's a reason why no state did that. Um, it, it, does that always, you know, will it, will it always hold? I don't know. I mean, I, again, as I said at the beginning, if I was really good at predicting things, I would not have a day job. I would be to the extent that um, it's public opinion that will be the guardrail, if you will, um, that makes it all the more important to be civically engaged and to make sure that your public opinion is heard. And one of the key ways you can do that, of course, is through voting. Um, we are running up on the 6 o'clock hour. Do you have uh, one final question? Did you have a question or a comment? I think we all have reasons to be deeply pessimistic about the future, and I don't see anything short of beginning to engage with kids at a very young age and try to do everything we can through the educational system or through whatever, whatever affiliations we have to focus on building that consciousness at the very, very beginning of people's lives. I think it's also building trust in in some aspect that you might be able to make a difference rebel well it's more of a comment and maybe get a response especially from the media um i watch a lot of tv and a lot of cable tv and i see all the ads going on these days and 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 they've gotten so bad this year that it's it's not what i believe it's that guy would do this to you or this guy has done that to you and and i listen to them and i sometimes i go god damn it I don't like that either. And then I go, wait a minute, none of that is true, you know? And so from a media standpoint, I mean, I, I wonder why our local television stations put on some of this garbage that any, anybody who did a little bit of research would know it's not true. So my question to a radio station operator, for example, will you put on any political ad or will you go back to that, that person who sent you that ad and say, okay, I want to see it in writing, and I want to justify every claim that you've got there, because if there's a lie in there, I don't feel comfortable in broadcasting it. Sure. I, I think the very short answer to why they run them in the first place is money. I mean, TV stations especially, they, they need whatever help they can get, and so they'll, they'll take it. And most of the time, when you look at the outside spending or you know, special interest groups, most of the time that are putting on these ads, if it's not uh, paid for by the candidate themselves, you know, that, that, that's a very big chunk of their bottom line when it comes to the, to the end of the year. It's a little different from us. You know, we've been around for 70 years. We are, we are independent. We are for profit. So we do have advertising dollars. I'm not sure if we've ever been put in a position where we have had somebody come to us with an ad that has, a, you know, has a falsity and it has a, a, a straight up lie. 
because I think part of it is that we're operating on the local level. I think when you when you know the person who you are running against, or you know as a voter, you know both of the people and you know a little bit of the backstory, you know what is true and what's not about that person, or you can pick out a lie easier. So on the local level, sometimes I think it's a little easier to to fact check and keep keep it within keep it within the lines. I think it would come down to, you know, if we were presented with that, it would come down to the the leadership of the station and, you know, saying, are we going to put a stake in the ground? I would like to think that the answer would be we, w we would not run it because in, in my mind, I've, I've got faith in our leadership that we're dedicated to making sure that folks are informed and informed with the, with the truth. But thankfully, we haven't, we haven't been faced with that yet. Um, and I do think that us being a local, trusted, you, you put faces to names and voices you hear on the radio, I think that makes a difference versus a, a, you know, a TV conglomerate where these deals and, and these ads are happening several degrees removed from the people involved. What makes this really hard, though, is, is think through the flip side of this. What if we said, okay, we're not, you know, I mean, the reason we do this constitutionally is the First Amendment protects your right to say whatever idiotic thing you want to say. Uh, you know, the alternative to that is, okay, well, we're going to have someone police content. Who's that going to be? How are they going to do that? How are we going to decide these things? Do you want a candidate out there saying, well, these bozos won't run my ad. They're trying to shut me up. You know, I'm saying something that's unpopular and they won't even let me, let me say it. Is that the kind of society we want to live in? I don't, I don't think, I don't think any of us want to sign up for censorship. You know, we were talking about book banning. Are we, none of us, I'm in a bookstore. We don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, the, the theory behind it, right, and we can question whether it's working, is this is a marketplace of ideas. And if you want to go babble idiotic things, then people are going to figure that out, and, and that will that will take care of itself. But but it's it's never been harder to, I think, for people to to want to sort it out and to sort it out. And so that's uh, that's a big challenge we face. And it's sort of challenging when that marketplace of ideas has been brought to such a low denominator of, you know, Photoshopping and and sometimes just outright lying of, of the connections. And I do think it goes back to as well, like being able to pull information from anywhere, not necessarily checking whether that's a, a verifiable source uh, that you're getting said information from. I, I think it, yeah, it, 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 is, it is pretty shocking what we're seeing out there this year. And I don't necessarily know what the answer to it is necessarily, but I do think it, it correlates to, you know, you're going for shock value, you're going for, for fear factor for the vast majority of these ads because that is what moves the needles for voters, unfortunately. I like something you said, uh, Dr. Stroman, about we're, we're in a narrative society right mm -hmm. now. And, like, and, and I wonder if at a certain point um, the facts will catch up to the narrative, that, that people will get bored of the story mm -hmm. because they go home and they realize, you know, whatever the cure for healthcare is, whatever, it's not working for me right now. And that at a certain point, I mean, this is just, this would be my hope that the facts can sort of become louder than the narrative as people begin to realize that these narratives are just getting tired and they're not actually moving policy forward. And the more certainly we have a broken, you know, system, uh, we're certainly not going to be moving forward. I'm afraid we're at our moment, but I want to thank our panelists, thank you. Dr. Stroman, Brighton McConnell, Dr. Jason Roberts. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us for Humanities in Action. Uh, I think this is an important discussion, but this discussion doesn't just happen here. This discussion should happen for the next week and then forever after uh, with you and your friends uh, and if, with strangers, if you can. Uh, it is important that we continue to have a civic engagement, and that means in our daily lives as well um, so again thank you to our panelists thank you to flyleaf books put our hands together for flyleaf books um, I want to remind you we have two more seminars we have a seminar on the opposite of democracy that's authoritarianism coming up again Lloyd Kramer will be speaking there you got to hear his eloquence uh, already so if you want to hear more of that speaking about 20th century authoritarianism in Europe um, also, Humanities in Action will be back. We start on February 1 next year, and the whole theme next year will be on um, international and global issues, including climate change. Our first talk will be an update on just what is going on with Vladimir Putin. So um, we'll see where we are in February. We'll see all of you next time. Thank you. <laughs>